Hello and welcome back. We're going to dive into the uh, 1962 catalogue again, the 8th edition. It says it was just nine pence here. Seems like a fairly reasonable price. We should have a quick look at the back. We've got some uh, Super 4 geometry. I believe uh, Super 4 showed up in this year. And there is a, a dealer stamp there. I wonder if anybody uh, remembers that. Still, we're going to have a look at uh, page 20 at the uh, some of the transcontinental models. There we go. They're shown in sets. And it does say here, the locomotives illustrated are available separately. And we're looking at the uh, TC Pacific, and that had a catalogue number of R54 and R32 for the tender. And importantly, in this year, 1962, she gained the name Hiawatha. The locomotive had been available since 1954, um, but it didn't get this name till uh, 62. And I believe it disappeared from the catalogue by 1964, although it was, was available in other markets up until the early 70s from what I've read. So we'll just pop this down and we'll uh, have a look at the price list. Price list dated 1st of January 1961. Let's have a, a swift look there. And then we'll just have a, a quick look at the TC models here. And we've got R54, Hiawatha Loco, 58 and 3. And then we've got R54S, Hiawatha Loco with smoke, 70 and 5. So quite a significant price difference, isn't there? We'll just pop that down. We'll have a swift look at the boxes. Here we go, you can see fairly poor condition. The tender boxes, uh, got great rubber stamping on the end there, R32, tender for R54 and R54S loco. The tape has uh, interfered with that a little bit, hasn't it? The, the, the tape has been all over these boxes. If you look, I think it's been taped together so the, the two items stay uh, united, as it were. So we'll just have a look at the end of the locomotive box. And there we, there we have uh, R54S, Pacific Loco Hiawatha, with smoke and magnet adhesion. So, fairly tatty box, but locomotive in absolutely superb condition. Apart from, she's missing her name plates, which is uh, really unfortunate. We'll just have a swift look over the, the model. And if you look very carefully in the light there, you can see where the name plates, where the stickiness or the gum and you can all also just see the letters just picking out there. They were long gone by the time I got the model, sadly. And I've had it for a year or so, but never never really run it and always thought I'll get around to uh, doing something about the nameplates. We'll have a look on, on the other side there. You can just see it there, can't you? Just in the, in the glue residue. That doesn't rub off, actually. It's just ingrained into the plastic. So uh, I have uh, generated some more and uh, I'll explain how in a moment. So we'll just have a look there, that uh, lovely plate around the back of the cab there and with all those rivets, that's got to be a separate part, I think. And we've got, is it, is it a bell and, and a whistle there? Terrific stuff, isn't it? Look at that uh, lovely white detail down the side. And we'll look at it on the other side, completely different in a straight line. Lovely thing. We'll just pop that down and have a swift look at the uh, the tender. Eight wheel tender. Lovely bold number there and that white line running right the way down the, the bottom edge of the tender. Earlier models, I believe, didn't have the white line on the tender. And uh, I do have a, an earlier acetate model, which we, we'll have a, a swift look at a little later on. Lovely cold detail there, isn't there? I believe that's supposed to represent a lamp. Great ladder and lots of rivet details. Detail, sorry. I do like those bogies, they, they do look quite impressive. Swift look underneath. We've got the triangle and there. The catalogue number, R32, made in England. And we've got uh, sleeved wheels with uh, open axle boxes. Lovely thing. Look at the rivets down the side of that. Dozens and dozens of them. Great big drawbar as well. Really chunky old thing. I believe that there was a variant made in um, in the early 70s which had the Flying Scotsman tender. Principally, I think that was to enable it to have chuff-chuff sound. So I have uh, generated um, some sticky labels. Well, they're not sticky yet. And uh, I've made, I've copied these, I have to admit. I do have a set with, uh, with a higher water in it, if you look at the inset picture there. But I believe the set to be completely unrun, and that's my intention 
to leave it that way. I know some of you don't uh, agree with that, but there we go. So I think I'm gonna knife these ones out here and we'll uh, get those attached to the locomotive and see how she looks. I think that nameplate looks pretty good. Just listen to the sound she makes. Wonderful clatter over the turntable and out through points 18. We'll switch those and off past the station. Red and silver coach is waiting nicely at the station there. And we'll bring her just beyond points 11 to a gentle stop. She smokes really nicely, doesn't she? Running at speed, and we can still see plenty of vapor coming off there. We'll just have a, a swift look around the model, sorry, the chassis, in fairly tidy condition. Hasn't done a lot of work, this model. You can see there's, there's hardly wear, any wear on those wheels, is there? Wiring looks to be all in, in fairly tidy condition as well, doesn't it? Lovely, simple assembly for that light bulb, for the front headlamp, isn't it? I just love that, really terrific. So if we look around the other side, again, lovely fluted valve gear. I do prefer the uh, the plain valve gear of the earlier model. I think I think it looks a, a stronger model, to be honest. We've got the little cutouts in the in the metalwork there, which slot into the into the uh, plastic bodywork. We'll have a look at that moment. We've got magnet adhesion on the magnet behind the drive wheel. We've got steel tires on these wheels. I think we've got a magnet behind the front drive wheel as well. I think the uh, the bogey here is the same as that used on the uh, the Baltic tank we were looking at a couple of weeks ago. I'm just going to pop something over the top of that uh, smoke unit where we tip it upside down and, and have a look so we don't have any accidents. There we go. Lovely looking thing, isn't it? We'll just pop that down and we'll... Uh, have a look at the uh, the plastic bodywork. I'll just pick that up. And there's those uh, paper labels that I've knifed out. If you look at the insert picture, I did try and uh, colour in the, the edges of the paper with, with a bit of uh, ma uh, not magic marker, but uh, marker pen. But uh, it, it grabbed at the paper a bit too much, so I've left that and just left them just knifed out. Problem is the the originals were, were die stamped out of paper rather than cut square with, with, a, with a blade. But a uh, lovely looking body. And I don't know whether these are, are metal or plastic as separately fitted parts. They're, they're rather dull. I don't know whether they would go shinier if you polished them. And I think this uh, rear plate here is definitely a, a separately fitted part. I have to be careful with my, uh, my fingers on here after having uh, handled the chassis to give it a good Good clean over afterwards. We should have a swift look inside. And we can see just there the underside of that chimney, the, the damage I was talking about from the heat. So I think if I was going to run this model all the time, I'd probably disconnect the smoke unit because you have got to run it too quick to, to really get anything to show. And we've got uh, Made in England there. And if I turn that around, you should be able to see the model number on there as well. We've got Triang and R54. So in, in fairly tidy condition, not even any sort of spray off the uh, the motor splat from the oil on the inside, which we usually see. So it really hasn't done much work. And that's where the uh, the chassis just clips in. Just there, we we're looking at those two, two cutouts in the, the chassis a few moments ago. They just hook into there. And we can see the slot there and then you get a very large securing screw straight through the front here. We'll just have a quick look at it. There we go, quite a large old thing, isn't it? To uh, sit in plain view. And that lovely rivet straight through the front of the smoke box door there, providing a little bit, a little bit of heat protection, I suspect, for the, uh, for the plastic work there. I'm gonna switch points 11, and we'll roll back gently into the station and see if we can hook up with those red and silver coaches. I think we have those. And they're smoothly off. A lot of power available with this locomotive. And then we'll switch those points once they're all the way out. There we go. Look at that 
beautiful coming towards camera. The occasional glimpse of the lamp there on the front of the locomotive. Very much an angle of view thing, I think. The, the bulb's buried quite deep behind that uh, rivet in the, the plastic bodywork. And we're not really running quick enough for it to get to glow very brightly or to get that uh, smoke generator fired up, really. And that second radius curve, lovely purring noise again coming from this motor. They really are a splendid group of coaches, these. I don't know why they didn't last longer in the range. Now we're going to come to points number seven, onto the outside line. Very well behaved through there. As we've got the uh, 62 catalogue out, we'll have a look at page 23 with this terrific range of, of coaches there. We've got the uh, two-tone green, the red and the silver, and the, the blue and yellow. I believe uh, these started life, the, the two-tone green ones in the catalogue in 1961 with trying railways across the top, and I believe the same moulds were used to produce the uh, the red and silver and the blue and yellows in the, in the year to follow. I think the uh, the green and the, the, the silver and red disappeared quite quickly by 63 or 64, and the uh, the blue and yellow seem to have, have gone on extensively, possibly up until the um, 1970s, although possibly not in production all the way through. So we'll just have a, a swift look at the numbering on these. So we've got the observation, R441. We've got the diner, R443. We've got the uh, passenger coach, R440. And the, uh, the baggage stroke kitchen car, R442. We'll just pop that to one side for a moment. Now I do have boxes for three of them. These three came together, but sadly, the boxes are in fairly poor condition. Somebody's applied rather a lot of tape to these, and uh, it uh, hasn't done them a lot of good in, in the long run, I don't think. We'll just have a swift look at the ends of there. So I've got the coach, the diner, and the baggage stroke kitchen car there. The uh, observation I have came, came separately. Um, let's have a look at the, the pricing on them. It's quite interesting because if we see uh, our 440, the standard passenger coach there with seats is 12 and 2, and then the observation coach below, our 441, is a signif significantly higher price. If we look at that, and it's 14 and 2. So all that extra, extra of a production cost there in, in producing the dome on the top of the car, and you see the, the baggage and the, uh, the diner there at uh, 12 and 2 as well. So I'll pop the uh, price list to one side. We'll have a swift look over the coaches. So um, the baggage and the, uh, the diner and the coach are really in very, very good condition and uh, pro probably because they've spent most of their life in the boxes. Um, the observation is, is a little bit more play-worn. Lovely detailing, isn't it? Especially this under-frame detail. Now, these do have um, sleeved wheels on, on a metal axle, but they're, they're closed axle boxes. They're not pinpoints. They do create a lot of friction, these wheels. They're, they're, not, uh, they're not as good as the pinpoints, but possibly slightly better than the open axle boxes, certainly in, in the looks department. So we can't see the ends of the axles. Really quite beautiful things, aren't they? So molded in a, a silver plastic. The roofs are molded in a, in a gray plastic. So we'll just pop that down. Lovely lines on the on the uh, perspex or cellophane used for the for the window detail, aren't they? I think that is quite pretty. We'll have a look at the uh, the diner. Got a, a full set of seats in there. Again, lovely underframe detail. Trying's names on the bottom of all of these. And they really are quite uh, quite intricate bogies there, aren't they? I don't know whether these are handles or steps on the side. Interesting details, whatever they are. So I'll just pop that down. We'll have a look at the passenger coach. I love the angle of the seats in these. Look, look at those through the windows. Uh, terrific. There's some sort of marking there. I'm not quite sure what that is. Lots of flow lines in the plastic in these models. You can see it on, on the under, underside here, it really is quite severe, isn't it? So we'll just pop that down. And here's the uh, the expensive observation coach. 
You can see it is a bit more play worn than the others. The paintwork's wearing through a little where it's been uh, in and out of the, the toy cupboard, perhaps. It would have been nice to have a working lamp on the back of these, perhaps. But possibly quite a costly feature to employ. You can see why we've got the extra cost going on there, the production and making this Perspex insert in there and the extra seating unit and the, the additional molding. And it really is quite nice detail over the top of there, isn't it? So lovely things. You can see this one's uh, probably later in the production runs it's received the the pinpoint style axles and the plastic wheels, still quite coarse wheels though. Still really lovely things. I think I mentioned earlier that these uh, red and silver coaches, along with the uh, two-tone green ones we saw in the catalogue, were out of production by the mid-60s, sadly just leaving the blue variants available up until the 70s. But there were other interesting ones made for different markets. For Canada, there was uh, Canadian Pacific, and uh, I think there were two variations of those available, as well as uh, Canadian National. And Australia got um, Trans-Australia coaches instead of Transcontinental, I think, and I think there was uh, a red, ver red and silver version of those, and a blue version of those. But interestingly, in 1967, Triang made um, four sets of coaches for an American company called American Train and Track, and they had uh, different American road names. There was Burlington, Baltimore and Ohio, Santa Fe and Pennsylvania. And they had uh, US style couplings. I think they were packaged appropriately for sale in the US. Now, we'll just bring these to a gentle stop just by the signals here. We'll just have a look at the model again and this time we'll look at it with the uh, earlier acetate model I mentioned from the uh, R7X set from 1954. 55 and you can see that tender there in the background shiny and black that has no white line running along its base and again the locomotive is very very shiny it has begun to warp the tiniest amount although the tender has warped more more than the locomotive body but it is really rather a, a shinier version isn't it than the later higher water variant that I have and if we have a look at the front ends there's that uh, great big securing screw there on the front end of the higher water we can see that's got the uh, Mark III couplings and the, the earlier acetate variant here doesn't have a coupling on the front and has that cow catcher molded into the, into the actual bodywork molding. It's a, quite a sophisticated piece of molding. That was re removed at a later date and there is another variant with a, a Mark II coupling and the cow catcher incorporated into that coupling. So there is a, a model which sits between that but we can't have all the variations out in the one go, it could get a little bit uh, time consuming. But I thought it would be here uh, quite nice to see the, the two side by side. The early acetate version didn't have a light or a smoke unit, and I think that feature came much, much, much earlier on. I love that detailing over the wheels there. Just look how that white line runs around all of that uh, gear, whatever that is there, electrical work or pipe work, I don't know. It really is a, a terrific looking feature. And again, looking down the side of the model, the, uh, the type on the sides is completely different, isn't it? So whilst it's the same numbers, it's, it's, a, it's a much cruder affair on the earlier acetate model. And I've got both models unhooked, so uh, we can have a, look, have a more close look at them. As we move on, you can see that warping on the old uh, acetate model there in the background. It really is quite severe. And I have added a little weight there to help it to run on the rails. She does actually run, I had her in a video um, some time ago. I'll leave, a, I'll leave a link to that. You can have a look at that if you'd like to. We'll just have a, a closer look at the uh, acetate model while we have the opportunity. So I just lift it up and we'll have a look at that cow catcher molded into there. And it's quite a moulding, isn't it? Lovely thing, very fragile, I imagine. I imagine these, these suffered a fair bit during uh, playtime. Uh, what's that? Possibly a coupling moulded into it there? I'm not quite sure. Uh, that great big piece of uh, clear plastic there to represent the lighting detail. 
It is really rather splendid, isn't it? And of course that uh, front bogey there with, with no coupling, as I said earlier. The next variant along had no cow catcher and the coupling had dropped down to here, but Mark II couplings and a cow catcher, plastic cow catcher incorporated into that. Really rather, rather splendid. What I forgot to point out earlier when we were looking at these is uh, there is quite significant cab detail down there. I don't know whether we can we can quite see that. If you look right down in there, you can see there is there's a, a fair bit to be had down there. So I think we'll pop that down, have a swift look at the this acetate tender. And pick this up. I think the printing on the side of this is quite fragile and some of it has sadly begun to to uh, flake off and you see the line, the bend in the acetate there. The bodywork hasn't hasn't gone quite so badly, it's, it's more subtle. Look at that from above as well. It's quite significant, isn't it? Still a really beautiful thing. And look down the other side. And then if we look at both tenders together, if I just pick up the other one, and we have a look at that. Look at the, the different bogies on there. This earlier one has a has a different design, doesn't it? And it's very, very shiny, that acetate, isn't it? It really is a great gloss finish. Now, doesn't she just purr really nicely, this model? And I love those plain coupling rods on these earlier models. Now, I wasn't gonna try and double head these, but I've had a fiddle with the coupling and I've managed to get it to work. It does ride a little high and it caused a few problems. It's the, it's the bend in that tender chassis, if you remember seeing it a few moments ago. But don't they just look great together? And the sound is uh, simply terrific. It doesn't quite come across on the video as I'm hearing it. I'll switch the points there. And smoothly down the side of the station, hoping for no unnecessary uncouplings over the diamond crossings here. It's uh, not, not the most perfect coupling. But, uh, it does look great, doesn't it? And now just negotiating the incline. Look at all those wheels going around. Absolutely fantastic. Lots of power available here. But I don't go too quickly, otherwise we might get a, a separation there. Especially as we go up onto the uh, suspension bridge there. It's not the, the flattest bit of track there. But I think we've made it. And off into the distance there. Looking terrific on the bridge. Now I think that's probably it for this week. It's uh, really great that you watched again. It's hugely appreciated. And I think uh, if you look back again next time, we'll we'll have something else from the range. And I did visit uh, another model railway show. Our local model railway club opened the doors to their uh, their club room, and they had all their layouts on display. So we'll, we'll have a look at that next time. But thanks again. Goodbye now.